Matthew chapter 20. For the kingdom of heaven, that's what the Jews are looking for, is like unto a man that is an householder. The kingdom of heaven is physical, which went out early in the morning to hire laborers into his vineyard, 6 a.m., Jewish time. And when he had agreed with the laborers for a penny a day, he sent them into the vineyard. That's a normal wage. And he said unto them, Go ye also into the vineyard. Wait a minute. Right. Verse 3. And he went out about the third hour, 9 a.m., and saw others standing idle in the marketplace. He said unto them, Go ye also into the vineyard, and whatsoever is right I will give you. And they went their way. He went out about the sixth and ninth hour, noon and 3 p.m., and did likewise. And about the eleventh hour, 5 p.m., he went out, found others standing idle, said unto him, Why stand ye all day idle? They said unto him, Because no man has hired us. He says unto him, Go ye also in the vineyard, and whatsoever is right, that shall ye receive. So there's a guy, he owns a vineyard, he goes out. And all day long, he's hiring people. He's firing people for work. Just go in my vineyards, I'll pay you. So when evening was come, 6 p.m., the Lord of the vineyard said, to, said unto his steward, Call the laborers, and give them their hire, beginning from the last unto the first. And that's where we left off in, in verse 30 of 19. And when they came that were hired, about the 11th hour, they receive every man a penny. Those are the last people that were hired. 5 p.m. They got a penny. That's what he said. But when the first came, that would be verse 1 and 2, 6 a.m. They supposed, even though verse 2 they had already agreed, that they should receive more. And they likewise received every man a penny. They weren't paid by the hour. They were given a salary according to the Bible. And the salary paid everybody no matter how many hours you worked. You want to call America a Christian nation? I think if you did this right here, I think you would balance all the books in America. You know, a penny's worth of just, just enough to get yourself some groceries. And when they had received it, the penny, they murmured against the good man in the house, saying, These last have wrought but one hour, and thou hast made them equal unto us, which have borne the burden and the heat of the day. The Americans are, are up tight. Like, yeah. We did more work, we learned, but you agreed. You know, can't pay that loan, can't pay that mortgage, and you know, I lost my... You agreed. You signed your name. You said you would do it. But he answered one of them and said, Friend, he has no quarrel with them. I do thee no wrong. Does not thou agree with me for a penny? Verse 2. Take that thine is, and go thy way. I will give unto the last, even as unto thee. And I still can't. I can explain it through the parable that just spoken, but as far as the real men, the last men that do service for the Lord is going to come up to the Lord first, and he's, they're going to get the same rewards that everybody else got. And it looks like there's going to be some gripers and complaints about the rewards. If, if you were to put this to, the, to an application for the judgment seat of Christ. Oh, the last man gets saved will probably go witness to somebody. And he'll get the same rewards for trying to witness that Peter, James, and John got. Nothing more, nothing less. And there'll probably some people will look at that. I did my whole life's ministry and did all this, blah, blah, blah. I've given it all. Isn't that what Peter said? Lord, didn't we give it all? 
See, we're continuing for what Peter asked Jesus. Lord, what are we going to get? We gave you everything. We left it all. What are you going to do when the last person gets saved? And he gives it all, but he's only served one day, maybe two days, three days, a month. What do you do with a guy who's in a hospital bed and gets saved? Cancer. And he witnesses to the doctors and nurses that come into the room. And then he dies the next day or the next week. But he don't get no rewards or anything at the judgment seat of Christ because he died soon after he was saved. He tried, didn't he? What do you get a guy who's in prison? Vile, vast, criminal person. The prison uh, minister comes in. He witnesses to him about Jesus Christ. He gets saved. 24, 48, hours, 36 hours later, he goes to the electric chair. And he's witnessing to the guards as he's going about the saving grace of Jesus. And then he's, the, the switch, is button, whatever it is is, is, is activated. And he dies in an electric chair. What, he don't get no rewards? He will die for the state for the crime that he did, but as far as the crime he did in the blood of Jesus Christ, there is none. God is fair. You know what God told me? I learned reading from my Bible. There are five crowns. I can earn, well, four crowns. I'm not a pastor. Those four crowns are offered to every Christian. I don't think the last Christian who ever gets saved, I don't think God's going to, uh, Lord Jesus, save my soul. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Boom. Da -da, Trump. I think God's going to give him some time to earn something. These guys, 5 p.m. Well, the whistle was blown at 6 p.m. God gave them an hour. This guy gave them an hour to work. And they got the penny. And there were some gripers and complainers. You know, we're not made fully right until after Revelation 20. You know, our tears are not wiped away until Revelation 21. And Jesus, going up to Jerusalem, here he goes. Took the twelve. Only the disciples. Apart. He pulled the twelve together, together alone in the way and said unto him, Okay, come here, come here, you twelve. Behold, we go up to Jerusalem, and the Son of Man shall be betrayed into the chief priest and unto the scribes, and they shall condemn him to death. How many times has Jesus told them this? This is the third time. Men, we're going to Jerusalem, and I'm going to die. I'm going to be rebuked. I'm going to be scorned. I'm going to be, uh, they're just going to mistreat me. Third time Matthew records. <clears throat> Excuse me. And shall deliver him, Jesus, to the Gentiles to mock. So it just didn't go with the, the Sanhedrin. It went with the Gentiles too. They mocked him. To scourge. That's the cat of nine tails. And to crucify him. And the third day he shall raise him. You that? That's the third time he told him. He's coming out of that grave. They didn't believe it. Why? Then came him the mother of Zebedee's children with her sons, worshiping, desiring certain things of him. He just said something very important of his life to his disciples. Mama comes up. He said to her, What wilt thou? She said unto him, Grant that these my two sons, James and John, might sit at may sit the one on the, thy right hand and the other on the left in thy kingdom. You didn't give no regard to what he just said is gonna to happen to him. I'm gonna die for you guys. I'm gonna be abused by the Gentile. I'm gonna be mocked. I'm gonna be crucified. Lord, can I can I be in charge? Isn't this the third time they've done this? No wonder they didn't get it. No wonder the women that had no idea. They're thinking about other things. 
Yes. But Jesus answered and said, Ye know not what ye ask. Are you able to drink the cup? Now you gotta get that. That cup is a very important word in the Bible because that cup is the cup of wrath of God. You know what the Roman Catholic Church gets wrong in their mass? He said, here, take this cup and drink it. Not what's in it. Jesus, and we're going to get to it later. He, he, says, he says to God in the garden praying, Lord, if you can take this cup, not death. Cup in the Bible is the wrath of God. Every nation has a cup. And we read about with, with uh, he, he tells Abraham in Genesis 12, I believe it is. He says, no, it's not 12. He says, your, your children are going to go into a, a foreign land for 70 years because the cup of the Amorites is not filled. When that cup gets filled, I'm going to release them out of Egypt. They're going to go in that land after 40 years, and then you're going to kick their butt because it's that. God said, hey, you know what? I heard that the cup of Sodom and Gomorrah, man, it's getting awfully full. I'm going to go down there and check it out. He sent angels down there. They wanted to molest those angels. That's it. The cup, the cup is starting to overfill. That woman in, in Mystery Babylon has a golden cup. That cup that Jesus is going to take is the filthiness of all our sin. That's why, behold, the Lamb of God takes away the sin of the world. All our sins, all our sins, all sins of all men have been put in that cup. And when he's saying, when he says cup right now, he's saying wrath. You couldn't take the wrath because watch what it said. Read it carefully. Shall, are ye able to drink of the cup that I shall drink of? And to be baptized with a baptism that I'm baptized with. That's no water. You can't find water nowhere there now. That's wrath, death, and burial. And then they say remarkable words. They said unto him, we are able. John is the only one that did not die of a violent death. But he was persecuted enough. James, I believe, has his head chopped off. I think James did. But they died a violent death. And he said unto them, Ye shall drink indeed my cup, the suffering. All they that live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. You boys are going to get it. That's a prophecy of the book of Acts. And be baptized, death. When you take a body and you put it under water, that symbol is you've died. With the baptism that I am baptized with, death. A brutal death. But to sit on my right hand and on my left is not mine to give it. But it shall be given to them whom it is prepared of my Father. Now look what that says right there. Lord Jesus, let my son sit in the right hand and the left hand side of you. You're going to suffer like I'm going to suffer. You're going to die like I'm going to die. But, And he never rebukes the position. There is a seat to the left and to the right of where Jesus is going to sit. Who's going to sit in that seat? I have no idea. But she said in the kingdom, David... I have no idea. But he did not rebuke the fact is that there's a seat next to him and a seat next to him. Could be God and the Holy Spirit. I don't know. And when the ten heard it, they were moved with indignation against the two brethren. Well, they got angry. Peter probably got angry. He didn't think of it first. You know, this is the first time Peter didn't speak up. But Jesus called them unto him. He, he brought them back together again. Come on, boys. Get together again. Come on. Knock it off. Now, how do you know that Matthew is a Jewish book? You know that the princes of the Gentiles, see, there you go, exercised dominion over them. What? 
Well, in America, we have a president, we have a house, we have a senate, we have a mayor, we have a governor. We have, look at all the people that we as Gentiles have over us. Do you know what it was set up in the Old Testament under Israel? It was supposed to be just God the Father and the Levitical priest. That was it. And when God spoke to the Levitical priest, that was it. If you came to the priest and say, hey, listen, my, my, my neighbor here, I, I gave him a sheep and the sheep disappeared in his control. I want to know if he put his hands to it. God said, Mr. Priest, the lamb it ran away it, and a wolf ate it. That guy had no idea what happened. That priest would say, this guy is innocent. It just, it left. And there could be no more grudge. But they wanted a king. And look at the mess they got themselves into. But the Gentile, they want all these. They want kings. They want princes. They want blah, blah, blah. blah. Ooh. You know who's the rulership? In the millennium is Jesus Christ, David, and then the twelve apostles. Exercise dominion over them. And they're in the Roman government. Herod's just a puppet ruler of this of this area. Under another puppet. Under another ruler. And then it's going as far as high as Caesar. Exercise dominion over them. That they and they that are great exercise authority upon them. Don't be like the Gentiles, what he's saying. They don't get involved in politics. I got a greater commission for you guys. But it shall not be so among you. But whosoever will be great among you, let him be your minister. Minister, serving. Can you imagine a guy being called a minister by his church and he don't take care of his people, the congregation? They take care of him. I know ministers where I come from. They drive big old Cadillacs. And they don't do nothing for the people that, that are under him. He said, minister, wash their feet. That's going to come up in John. Pray for. Cry with those that are weeping. Rejoice with those that are, are rejoicing. And wh whosoever will be chief among you, let them be your servant. Ooh. That's against nature. Can you imagine a big CEO of a company coming down and working there on the assembly line with you? Hey, how you doing? Well, you're a new worker? No, I've been here for many years. Oh, really? Oh, good talking. Who, who are you? I'm, I'm the owner of this company. You're down here working on the assembly line with us? Yeah, this talking with you guys hey let's go have some lunch together you know this what he's saying even as the son of man came not to be ministered unto but to minister look at that jesus is the minister and to give his life a ransom for what's that word many not all i'm sorry the Bible says not everybody is going to heaven. Many for many. That's a sad fact. If you think everybody's going to be saved, you have never done any evangelistic work at all. And as they departed from Jericho, oh, look, we're in Jericho. A great multitude followed him. He's one day's journey from Jerusalem. He's at the cursed city. You know who else who was there? Joshua. Jehovah saves. And behold, two blind men sitting by the wayside. Is that one of the places where the seeds fell? When they heard that Jesus passed by, cried out, saying, Have mercy on us, O Lord, thou son of David, kingdom, king, Jewish. And Jesus stood still 
He's on his way to Calvary. Two blind men say, hey, and he stops for them. And called them and said, What will ye that I should do unto you? I did. And the multitude rebuked them. 31. Because they should hold their peace. Shut up. Stop preaching that name of Jesus. Ever hear that? We don't want to hear it. Shut up! You might get him over here. Leave him alone. Don't bring him over here. Hold their peace. That means shut up. But they cried out the more. So what does somebody do when they tell me you're too loud and they try to, I just speak up even loud, lift up my voice like a trumpet. That's biblical. And I bet you they didn't know that. When a crowd tells you to shut up when you're calling out Jesus, cry aloud. And Jesus looked out from him and I hate that. But they cried the more, saying, Have mercy on us. O Lord, thou son of David. It's a physical blindness. They can't see. And spiritually, they're seeking Jesus. How did they know it was Jesus? They were blind. Somebody had to say... Somebody had to mention Jesus in that crowd didn't, for them to know it was Jesus coming. Yeah, it says, when they heard that Jesus Christ so you know what you're supposed to do? You're supposed to tell all blind people Jesus is coming. Is that not what it's saying? That so a blind man can come out and say, Jesus. And those that don't want to hear, shut up. Jesus. And he'll stop. And he'll ask you what you want. Even though the crowd didn't want him to stop and ask him what they want. Isn't God great? Isn't he just one? He's going to the cross and these people told these people to shut up and just, wait a minute, they called out again. You know, you may not get saved the first time. You may have to call out to Jesus a couple times. But you'll get him to stop. And then when he asks you what you want, and Jesus stood still and called them and said, What will ye that I shall do unto you? They said unto him, Lord, you better address him as Lord, not master, not good master, that our eyes may be open. So Jesus had compassion on them and touched their eyes, and immediately their eyes received sight, and they followed him. You know, spiritually, I was blind. In April, 19, in April 21st, 1987, Jesus touched me and let the blindness go away, and I saw Jesus. And as I said today, I did, I did not physically see Jesus. I spiritually saw Jesus. There he was. He asked me, he goes, what would you want? You know how I answer him? I don't know. I don't know what I want. All right, just listen to him preach the word to you a little bit. You're going to hell. I don't want to go to hell. Well, you're going to hell. No, I don't want to go. I don't have that argument. I don't want to go. And at the end of the day, 1987, I asked Jesus Christ to save my soul. He opened my eyes that I may see. I believe that's one of the hymns. Open my eyes that I may see. I was going to keep on reading. But so Jesus had compassion on them and touched their eyes. You know, there's religions out there that have poked the eyeballs out. There are religions out there that have blinded the people worse. That's not compassion. There's a multitude that told these guys to shut up. And they spoke out even more. And Jesus stopped. He said, what can I do for you? He just said, verse 28, Even as the Son of Man came not to be ministered unto but to minister and to give his life a ransom for many. And up pops these two blind. What's up, everybody? These two guys need help. 
When it comes to the day of your salvation, you'll stop God in this. Stop everybody. Stop, stop angels. Something's going on down there. Let's just pay attention. Wait, wait, wait. He's on his knees. I hear my son's name. I hear the blood. I see the forgiveness. I see the blood. Okay, angels, now rejoice in heaven. A new name. Put that new name down in the book. That's what happens in heaven. That's what happens.